and you've probably all seen some kind of a title class along the way, but I think it's good to just remind people a little bit about what title is, what it is that we do, and the changes that are happening along the way. Because you'd be surprised, there are some agents that have been around 30 some years and have always used a transaction coordinator and have kind of just been behind the scenes and really have no idea what title does. They just know that we'll make the closing happen and we kind of take it from there after the purchase agreement is signed, but what does title really do? And it's good to know these things too, so that you can educate you know, your buyers and sellers of what's going on now behind the scenes so that they have a better understanding of that as well. So I have a slideshow just to kind of keep us rolling on our topics. I'm going to screen share right now. Hopefully this works. Can you guys see it? Does it yes. look like there's a title one-on-one -on -one close? Okay, good. <laughs> and I also have with me today, Sue Sipper. She's a closer of ours. She's been in the industry many, many years. And so she can really help everybody understand the closing process and help answer any questions you guys might have. And then I also have Phil Searin, and he's just a genius in the examining role at Minnesota Title. And that's one of those things where people really don't understand what happens in that section of the closing process. So I think it's really good for him to talk a little bit about that. So we'll just get rolling here. And... Basically, we're going to talk about understanding the title process from purchase agreement to closing table. And also, I want to say, if you guys do have questions along the way, I would love for this to be interactive. You can just chime in, maybe type in the chat. Maybe Robin can watch the chat or something and let us know if you have questions. Or sometimes I'll even say, ask if there's been a situation like that with any of you and feel free to chime in because I want this to be kind of an open concept so we can all engage each other. So getting started here, let me see how I move my slides. Hmm. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so the outline of discussion, what is title? What does a title company do? How can we ensure a smooth closing and understanding title insurance and kind of talk about what's new in title. And before I move on, I just wanna say, for those of you that don't know, Sometimes you've got a screen and you can see my slideshow and then there's people's faces in the way and all that stuff. You can go and click on the top where what it looks like a film strip and move that thing around. You can also change the view so it's just the speaker view or there's no people showing up on the screen just by clicking on those different dots on top. I don't even know if what, what I'm saying is making sense because it depends on your device, but I found out in the past that I'm like, why can't I see anything? And then I realized that you can actually move that around. So I always want to mention that when I'm doing these classes. So what is title anyway? And I know that most of you probably know what title is, but there's probably some newbies on the call that maybe aren't understanding that entire process. Maybe they haven't had their first transaction. Maybe they just got their real estate license. And it's not like everybody goes over all of these details when you're getting your real estate license. So basically, a title is a document that shows legal ownership to a property or asset. And a title can represent ownership of a real estate asset, such as a car or an intangible property or assets such as a trademark. When we're talking about real property titles, different from personal property, real property, cars and real estate is provided a title that conveys ownership. And whenever an asset is sold, the title is transferred to the buyer. All personal property that is sold or traded must be free of liens and other debts before the property can be transferred to another party. So in other words, the title must be clear. That's what we're talking about when we talk about clear title. So there's no creditors claiming ownership due to extending credit to a borrower. And a clear title means that the owner has no disputed claims to the property or asset. And if it's not clear, it would be considered bad title because there could be outstanding liens against the property, back taxes owed or unresolved, building code violations and things like that. So it's really, really important that a title search is performed by a title company to ensure that there are no liens, back taxes or issues with the title. And having a good reputable title company that does a really good search is very important. There's a lot of different kinds of companies out there, a lot of different title companies, and it's kind of who you know and their experience that makes them better at their job. And there's different types of real estate titles too. There's 
tenancy in common, which involves two or more individuals who jointly own it. There's tenants by entirety, there's joint tenancy, there's community property or sole ownership, all these different types of titles. And so once the title company takes hold of the file, they figure out all these things and keep it moving along the process. So these are kind of, kind of some common traits that people look for in a title company. You know, we really take pride in what we do. People that are in title stay in title for a reason. They really do enjoy that kind of back end process of helping somebody get into a new house and have it being of clear title. There's a lot of teamwork that goes involved, involved in the process. There's timeliness, customer service is huge, having that thoroughness and also respect for the clients that we're working with. And you probably have heard this many, many times, but the title company is a reflection of that real estate agent that either may have referred them or that has worked with their client. Because I know when I first bought my house and I actually bought a couple homes and it wasn't until I became a part of the title industry that I truly understood that, hey, I could have actually chose my title company. I didn't even realize that they were separate companies. I thought my real estate agent <laughs> was it like part of this company and they were all big one big thing which is good because that's kind of the feeling that you want as a buyer but i i just went under the direction of my real estate agent which is really important because as a real estate agent you kind of are directing that flow and you want to have some good relationships built with good title companies that are going to be a good representation of you because that's the final impression they're going to remember when they leave and that's a reflection of you and their experience so basically, those are some good traits of a good title company. And then one question we always like to ask is, what does a title company do to exceed your expectations? You know, title is title to an extent. I mean, it's pretty clear of what we do and the job that we have. But when it comes down to it, what are the things that a title company can do to go above and beyond so that you want to continue to use them and choose them and trust them? I think what a lot of people don't realize is that while title is title, the company itself is not always the same as the others. Not all companies function the same internally. And at Minnesota Title, we're always trying to stay on top of our game. And some of the things we're currently working on right now are the ability to text appointment reminders, which is a huge thing because especially since COVID, there's been a lot of things that have moved to technology. And even just the ability to text you know, a copy of the Alta over to the real estate agent so they can see it on their phone because everybody's got their phones on them. I mean, everybody I know anyways has a phone by them. Um, and ever since COVID came to town, a lot of practices have changed. Technology's at the forefront. We're doing all we can to keep up with the game. And we're also working on um, the ability to do the RON closings, which is the remote online notarization closings, so that similar to what we're doing right now, you can basically do a closing through what's similar to a Zoom meeting. Because it might get to that where everybody has to do that at some point. Who knows? I mean, we never expected we'd be where we are right now today either. So we're just trying to prepare for the future and things like that. There's a video on our YouTube channel that talks a little bit more about RON closings and what that looks like. So if you want to visit that later, you can. Um, also, we're trying to incorporate different um, CRM systems that will automatically send cards and thank yous and stuff out, which is some really cool technologies out there too. So, and also, um, I'm more than happy to meet with any agents to explain some of the things that we've done so that maybe you can incorporate them in your own businesses to help build your business with your clients too. Because these are some really good systems that I've discovered, especially during COVID. Melanie? So, Melanie? Yes. Um, just one, one little tidbit, if you, and you, can, you may be covering this at some point, but if you're not, um, someone asked if you could please touch on the importance of the well disclosure and location map at some point. Yes, absolutely. And we will get to that. And I'll probably let Sue talk about that when she speaks, because that's really, really, really important to understand. This I just threw in there for fun, because <laughs> I like it. Excellence is the gradual result of always striving to do better. And as a title company, we really want the feedback and we want the suggestions. I know it's really easy sometimes when you're in the hustle bustle of your, of your own business, to maybe think something in the back of your head, oh, I wish they did that or wouldn't do that. And you don't necessarily reach out, but we would love to hear feedback and suggestions. And I think that goes for all title companies because we're always trying to do things that we think the agents would appreciate and want, but I think it's best coming from them. 
So just being open about your expectations thus would be fabulous. And make sure your title company has a, a easy way to calculate fees. On our website, you can pretty much go in and determine the cost of things. Title insurance is an important coverage to purchase um, since it covers you and your lender <laughs> and all that stuff. So that kind of calculates in fees there too, which is also very important. And so now we'll go into a little bit about the life of a closing. And this is kind of just a broad overview of what happens. So if you're a new real estate agent on this call, you probably have somebody within your office, hopefully that's either a productivity coach or you know, somebody that's gonna help you with your first few transactions. But I also wanna mention, you know, at Minnesota Title, we have brought on somebody by the name of Pam Rudisell and she is a new agent liaison is what we call her. And she's somebody that's on call, uh, available via email or whatever, to where if you have questions through those first few transactions, she'll help you through them. And she'll look at your purchase agreement before you send it over, make sure that you have all the details on there. So I think it's really important to understand as a new agent that it's okay to have questions. You might not really feel comfortable knowing exactly what you're doing in those first few transactions. So we wanna make it easy for you. But basically you've got that purchase agreement and it's sent over to the title coordinator. And then also in the meantime, the title application is sent to the closing coordinator from the loan officer. So both those things are getting over to us. And then we have what's called uh, order entry where the coordinator sends the purchase agreement into order entry and they open it. And that is when the order is actually started. It's assigned a file number, which will be referenced throughout the entire transaction. And they're the ones that order that assessment search, the property search and plat drawing, and someone goes to the property and assesses it. And now we're getting more into the back end side of title. And I think this is a great spot where Phil, if you kind of want to talk about the abstracting and examiner portion of title and what happens on the back end. Are you open to do that, Phil? You're muted though. <laughs> do you know how to unmute yourself? Oh wait, maybe I can unmute him. Hold on. Let's see, right. okay. There you go. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought I unmuted myself earlier. Um, no, you're good. Can you hear me, Melanie? We can hear you, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. First of all, my name is Phil Sarah, and um, I was an attorney in uh, Seattle, Washington, for 20 years before returning to my home state of Minnesota. Been involved in the, the title industry here in Minnesota for about oh, 15 or 16 years. Um, actually, was a licensed abstractor um, up in West Central Minnesota for a while before coming to Minneapolis and working in the metro area here, starting about 11 years ago. Um, the process after order entry um, opens the file, um, it gets sent to uh, an abstractor and an abstractor is going to basically um, look at all of the records that are, uh, have been recorded with a county recorder's office, um, track down every document that's relevant, uh, compile what is called an abstracting package. Um, in the state of Minnesota, we are able to limit our search to typically 40 years. In other words, um, if we have a deed that's of record, that's recorded in the abstract in the county recorder's office, that's at least 40 years old. And then we see every single deed from that point up until uh, our current time, um, then we're able to establish uh, a good marketable title for a piece of property. What we're looking for, of course, is uh, a deed from an owner that had the property at least 40 years ago how they convey it to the next owner, the next owner, and so on. And uh, sometimes it's just a matter of several uh, sequential sales over the course of 40 years. Occasionally we have properties where uh, the person that's selling the property has actually owned it 40 years themselves. Um, sometimes an owner passes away, and then we go through a process called probate. Um, sometimes someone has some financial difficulties, and they maybe go through a bankruptcy. Um Sometimes people convey property to a trust uh, for a variety of different reasons, estate planning reasons. Um, sometimes it gets conveyed to a corporation or a limited liability company and so on. Um, and then over the course of this 40 year period of time, people typically uh, finance the purchase of property by taking out a mortgage. And so there's various mortgages that get recorded by different lenders along the way. And as those get paid off, there's hopefully satisfactions of mortgage that get recorded. Um, 
And at any rate, the, our abstracting department um, collects all the records relating to a piece of property and compiles them in an abstracting package and also includes uh, searches for federal tax liens, uh, judgments, things of that nature, um, and then submits it to the kind of the next step in the process, which is uh, for an examination of title. And so that, that's my current role here at uh, Minnesota Title. I'm one of uh, six examiners here at Minnesota Title. And then a uh, title examiner will look at all those documents and basically figure out uh, and put together kind of a roadmap or a blueprint, if you will, uh, listing all of the different things that need to be accomplished in order for us to close your transaction and end up with uh, where we have good title uh, in the name of our borrower. Um, and it involves uh, kind of understanding a bunch of different things, including how the probate process works, what happens if there's a bankruptcy, uh, what happens when someone passes away and maybe there's a, a joint tenancy um, involved or when trusts are involved or things like that. Um, that's just kind of a real quick nutshell of uh, kind of how the examination process works. I could certainly be happy to answer any specific questions. There was a question, and I'm not sure who can answer this one, but the, pro the question is, if the property was sold five years ago, can you use the title work on that sale to clear the previous 35 years? Well, boy, that kind of depends. Um, if, well, I'm here at Minnesota Title. So, for example, if Minnesota Title closed the last transaction, then we've uh, in order to do that, we have examined the full 40 years worth of uh, documents. And in that case, then we can just kind of take that forward. Um, however, if another title company has did the prior closing, um, we're not allowed to just rely on the work that they've done. And so uh, as a result, every step of the way, um, there's kind of really a, a new look at the sequence of documents that get recorded um, to verify that the the new owner actually has uh, will have good and clear title at the end of the process. Um, Minnesota is one of the few states that has a significant uh, number of properties um, where title is is registered under what's called the Torin system or registered property. Um, Everybody is, of course, familiar with the title that you get when you buy an automobile. And it's really, really simple. It's just a, a title of an, um, for an automobile. It's going to be a one-page document that lists who the current owner is. And then if there's a lien holder, it's going to list, you know, for example, U.S. Bank, if, they're, if they have a, a, a lien on the, on the automobile. Um, in the case of registered property or Torrance property in the state of Minnesota, it's a little bit like that automobile title in that uh, you have a certificate that is prepared and updated constantly whenever new documents are recorded uh, by the county uh, Torrens department. It's gonna list who the name is and then what encumbrances and any other easements or anything that affects title um, that's, that's on the title. And so in those cases, uh, when we have a new file where someone is selling property that's Torrens, um, then we don't need to go back 40 years, but we can actually just simply examine the document that is the Torrent certificate, and then any documents that are that are listed on the Torrent certificate. Um, so it's a it's a much quicker process. Um, you know, there's only a few states in the entire country that that use the Torrent system. It actually came from Australia, uh, and then they started using it in Canada, uh, and a few states in the, in in America use the Torrent system. So in Hennepin County, about maybe 25% of all property is, is Torrens property. And Ramsey County and Anoka County also have a significant number of property that's Torrens. Um, it's kind of sprinkled uh, out throughout the rest of the state. Um, so that's the one case where we don't really have to go back 40 years. Um, other, than, other than that, um, we pretty much have to make sure that we, every, every time there's a new transaction, uh, whatever title company is involved is gonna have to make sure that we've got good title and potentially go back 40 years. Bill, can I just ask a quick question? This came up, um, I just closed a, a property and it was a probate, it was an estate. And as we were going through title, 
they found out that there was a small line of credit that was never recorded properly. And mm -hmm. so I think it was like through a credit union. So the credit union was in essence arguing with the title company saying that because it was like 60 or $75,000 and the house had been paid for many, many, many years, they had lived there since I think 82, that the title company should have just waived it. But right now we're still in a quiet title search, I think they called it. Do different title companies work differently? If I had gone to say Minnesota title, would you, could you have waived this? Well, boy, you know, I don't have enough information to really fully answer that question. Um, but typically if, well, so in theory, the real estate title uh, process in, Minnesota, in a state like Minnesota is, is, is based on what's actually recorded at the recorder's office. So if a lender gives someone a line of credit and they're going to typically, it's going to be a mortgage and often it's going to be like a second mortgage. Um, you know, typically it's their responsibility or if it's closed by a title company to get that recorded at the recorder's office. Okay. And then it's going to appear on title. Um, it sounds like in your situation, for some reason, it either didn't get recorded or there's also a possibility that in whatever county the property is in, um, the recording department didn't properly index it so that when you search the property, that it shows up and you can find it. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the situation is. And it's, uh, there's basically four major title companies that are doing, or underwriters that are doing business in the state of Minnesota. We've got Fidelity, which includes Chicago Title and some of their other subsidiaries. We've got Old Republic National Title Insurance Company. Uh, there's First American and there's also Stewart Title. Um, Minnesota Title, uh, we are authorized agents for First American and Stewart Title. Um, all four of those major companies have very, very slight differences in how they handle different situations. And um, so it's, it's really impossible for me to tell you what, you know, what we've done without knowing a lot more about that situation. But um, if, if there is significant evidence, if, if there is you know, rock solid evidence that this, this lien had actually been paid off, this uh, line of credit or whatever it is, had actually been paid off, it, it's possible we could have insured over it. Um, but I'm saying that without seeing all, all the documents. So that's, um, boy, tough to really, to really rely on that. Um, I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but uh, it, it sounds like if you, when you say quiet title, quiet title is actually a, a lawsuit that gets filed with the court to determine the status of title. Um, often quiet titles are done if there's a dispute over where the boundary is, or if there is an error in a legal description in a document that gets filed. Um, it sounds like in a, in a situation that you've described, if there's a quiet title action, it's probably a situation where the lender um, is insisting on getting paid and uh, the, the seller is, is maybe insisting on not paying the lender, um, even if it's not actually recorded with the real estate records, but the title company has knowledge that this is a, is a mortgage. There's actually a mortgage out there that just somehow didn't get recorded properly. Um, kind of the, the default position of the, of the underwriter is going to be that we need to take care of that lane somehow if we have actual knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. that's, about, that's about the most uh, precise answer I can give you without actually seeing more of the documents. Good answer, Phil. Does anyone else have any questions right now about the abstracting and examining kind of part of title? Okay. There is a, there is a question, uh, a couple of questions actually. Yeah. One is, if the process is completed correctly, then why is title insurance needed? And the second one is, if a vendor does work on a property, how long do they have after they complete the work and are not paid to place a lien on the property? Yep. Okay. Two different questions. And if I forget the second one, maybe I'll do the second one first. Uh, so we're, I think we're talking about really mechanics liens, right? The second one, if someone does substantial work uh -huh. on the property. Um, maybe I should start with just kind of the, the general premise of how title works and how the, uh, the law works in terms of liens and so on. Um, as a general rule in Minnesota and in most states, we have what's called race notice. So 
if different people that claim an interest in the property, maybe lenders, for example, um, maybe a couple different lenders have, have loaned money to uh, an owner of a property, um, one, or, one, one of them is probably going to have priority over the other one. And that depends on who recorded the mortgage first. So if uh, I own a piece of property and I go to U.S. Bank and get a you know, $20,000 line of credit, and at the simultaneously I go to Wells Fargo and get a $40,000 line of credit, and maybe I do it on the same day, you know, they, they don't even know that, that I'm working with each other, um, whoever races to the courthouse and records their mortgage first is going to have priority. And so, for example, if a U.S. Bank gets their mortgage to the courthouse first, um, and then I don't pay either one of those mortgages, and they both end up foreclosing, um, U.S. Bank is going to be in first position, so they're going to get paid first. Um, so, so it's it's kind of race notice. However, there's a special rule, a special set of rules that apply to people that do work on the property, and that that could include surveyors who actually do some staking of the ground. It could be. Um, uh, a builder who actually builds a home. It could be a plumber who um, is just a subcontractor, never even met the owner, but they're hired by the home builder to do the plumbing work. Um, the law in the state of Minnesota is pro provides kind of a special status for people that are entitled to mechanics liens or big contractors or anybody who does work to improve a piece of property. And so to basically start with, um, their priority is going to go back to the day the first person actually starts work on a construction project. So, for example, if uh, I own a vacant lot and I hire XYZ builder to build a new home for me, um, it may be that they first come out with a backhoe and start digging for the foundation on October 1st of this year. Um, the company that if they've, uh, the, the excavator, the, the company that comes and does the excavation uh, is gonna have um, four months after they start the work, a four month period of time to file a notice of mechanics lien. Um, and if they do that, they're basically kind of letting the world know that they've done some work on the property and they expect to get a claim and they're claiming a lien. So if they start work on October 1st, they might not file the lien until December 1st, but if there's a dispute between them and say a, a, a lender that loans me money to help pay for the new home that I'm building, um, their priority is gonna go back to October 1st. And if it's a project that involves not only an excavator, but a plumber and an electrician and a roofer and a whole bunch of other different people, um, everyone that comes along later, uh, they're going to have priority that goes back to October 1st because that's when the whole project started. So basically the people that do work on a, on a property have four months after the time they start work on a property to file a mechanics lien. Uh, once they file a mechanics lien, they don't do any. They don't need to do anything else for a period of 12 months. After 12 months, however, if they haven't been paid and they think there's a problem, then they need to file a lawsuit to foreclose the mechanics lien. And a lawsuit to foreclose a mechanics lien can maybe go on for a year or two until that gets resolved. Um, so basically, there's a four month period to just file a, file a simple notice of mechanics lien. Another year before you actually file a lawsuit to foreclose a mechanics lien, um, that kind of covers the, I, I think that answers uh, the, the, the second question there. So I guess just one other thing I guess I should add, um, if in order to build my house, I'm getting a, you know, a $300,000 mortgage from um, Firefly Credit Union in order to pay for the home, they're gonna typically, and the title company is gonna typically require that if I'm closing on that loan, for example, on September 28th, and I'm anticipating that we're going to build a home on it. Um, they need to know that their mortgage is going to take priority over the home builder and the plumber and the electrician. They don't want to give me three hundred thousand dollars to build a home. I build the home, and a whole bunch of contractors don't get paid, and then all of a sudden they're in second or third or fourth position um, behind all of those mechanical claimers. So the way that is handled is to have uh, um, 
typically priority pictures taken. So we do a closing, for example, on September 28th, knowing that the contract, the, the construction project is gonna start soon. We send out someone with a camera to actually take pictures of the vacant lot so that they can testify if need be and establish that uh, our mortgage that got recorded typically the very same day of our closing um, has priority over any potential mechanics liens. So that's the last part of this question. There was a two part question and I forget, can you remind me again the first part of the question? The first part of the question, well, it was a, the other question was, okay. um, if the process is completed correctly, then okay. why yep. is insurance needed? Yep. Okay. Well, let me just use a different example. Um, if, uh, you know, I have title and I have uh, automobile insurance for my car, right? Liability, uh, personal injury protection and things like that. Um, if I drive my car perfectly, I don't ever need to ask for any money for the uh, automobile uh, and my title, my uh, insurance company or anything like that. Uh, but the reality is people make mistakes and I may cause an accident, uh, cause some damage to somebody else or cause some damage to my own car. Um, and so people make mistakes um, and title insurance protects you from that. Um, that's just a real short answer to the uh, to that question, I think. Well, and I do think too, some like we do the best that we can with searching the records, but you can't say for certain 20 years ago, someone in the recording department missed something or someone, I mean, because we're all human beings doing these tasks, right? And we've all had different jobs in our lives. And you know, some people always do a little bit better than another or <laughs> mistakes can happen. And so there's no reason in my mind why anybody would not want to protect the biggest investment of their life because there might be right. that one, 2% chance where someone missed something or there could be a missing error you didn't know about, some will that was never brought to light, some kind of, who knows? There's just a lot yeah. of different things that can happen. So it, it's just a no brainer to protect yourself um, from those errors, because we we see what we can see, but we can't see everything all the time. Maybe, maybe I can give you just another example. Um, you know, a, a lot of things, uh, quite a few things that are per, that you have protection from in title insurance are things that can't be discovered by a title company, even if you do a perfect job. So, for example, I talked about the the forty year chain of title. Um, it may be that, for example, um, forty years ago, a piece of property was owned by a Robert W. Wilson. Um, and unbeknownst to anybody, Robert uh, B. Wilson got married uh, five years later. Um, and two years after that, um, he appears at closing, signs a deed saying he's single, doesn't tell anybody. Um, there may be that there's no way for a title company to actually know that. Um, and uh, the, the ex-wife or, or wife, if he's still married, uh, may assert a claim later and um, Although there's nothing that a title company, um, no reason for the title company to have known that that uh, that our seller that a seller lied about that, um, you know, title insurance is going to protect against forgery and things like that. Right. Thanks. There's actually quite a few. I you know I could think of quite a few different examples where um, you know title insurance protects you against things that a, a title company doing a perfect job would would not have been able to discover anyway. You know, sometimes title insurance uh, will protect you from an error that a title insurance company actually makes. Right. That's true. Thank you. Hey, Melanie, and just so you know, we, I'm just going to do a little time check here. We've got about, um, you've got about 18 minutes because I want to give Kathy okay. about five minutes at the end to introduce herself because, because uh, we didn't get to her at first thing in this morning. So, Sounds good. Um, do you want to, uh, are you going to be able to get through your slide presentation? Yep, I'll keep on rolling here. Okay, got it. Okay, um, so one other question that you might want to cover at some point too is, is it true that right now title insurance is important because many jurisdictions are behind on their filings? I haven't heard that question. What is, what is your okay. thought, Sue, on that or Phil? See, I can just interject real, real quickly. One of the things that title insurance yes, um, due to COVID. For is what's called gap coverage. Um, so, for example, if uh, if we get a new file, we yes. uh, a realtor brings us a purchase agreement um, that was just signed last week, 
And uh, we're going to close it one month from today. The first thing we do is uh, go get all of the recording documents. Um, and the recorder's office is, 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 in many cases, they're not up to the minute in, in the recordings. Um, about, no, about 10 years ago, for example, in Ramsey County, um, they literally had a month's worth of documents stacked up that they had not been able to process. And so as a result, when we, we would send an abstractor to Ramsey County to get all the documents that apply to the, lot, the property we were dealing with, um, they're, they're basically going to say, these are the documents as of um, September 15th, 2020. And yet here we are on November 3rd. Um, if we're going to close it next week, there theoretically might have been a new mortgage that the seller took out just last week and just didn't tell anybody about. Um, so there's there's that gap. Uh, but title insurance is going to insure you up to the date of closing and up to the date that we record the deed that puts the buyer in title. So that that is actually an, an important thing that title insurance will do for the buyer. Right. Cool. Okay, we'll keep moving on here. So that was Phil's roll up into the examiner portion. And then we are into now what happens is it goes to processing. So Phil's department creates all of these documents of things that need to be done by the processor in order to clear the title. So on or before that closing date, you know, they receive the loan package from the lender, they put in all the fees, they create a settlement statement, they send it to the loan officer and agent to review and get the clear to close. So everybody, that's the big kind of part. Everybody's numbers need to match up. Everybody needs to know what's exactly expected on that closing day. And then that's when the closer comes in. And I'll let Sue talk a little bit about, maybe you can talk a little bit even about working with your coordinator and then the closing portion of the title transaction. My coordinator is, I have two. I have one that um, handles just the seller sides and I have one that handles just the mortgage sides. And they basically coordinate from uh, opening the files to getting everything prepared just before closing. And um, they're, they are the ones that reach out and get any information from the clients if needed, from the agents, um, as far as um, commission percentages, if anything shows up on title work, uh, a lot of times I'll reach out to the clients to um, if they, any additional information is needed. They also send out the final settlement statements to the agents and the clients for review. So they are the ones that physically put everything together, get everything prepared for closing, and then pass the final uh, uh, file over when it's ready for closing. Um, to me, and then I go to the closing table and take it from there. So they are really the hands-on people who are behind the scenes, putting everything together, uh, bringing it, getting it ready for closing. And then as a, as a closer, they're the, Sue's the one that like cuts the checks and disperses everything, prepares and sends the loan package to the lender and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff, wires and payoffs and things like that and kind of seals the deal. Yeah, I worked then on that final end piece with the lender and kind of finish it up, send everything for recording with the counties, make any disbursements and basically fund the final portion of that file and then close it out. So, um, and then it goes basically to final policies and recording for them to um, get the recorded documents for recording and then what's left to lender. And that pretty much closes it up. So the policies are created and sent to the parties and everything is, is uh, finished and, and closed up. So that's basically the entire kind of life of a closing. There might be some other little you know, parts in there, but these are the basic chunks of it. And now we'll talk just a little bit about what title insurance is. I know we just talked a little bit about that with Phil and the importance of title insurance, but there's two different types of title insurance. And the main point of title insurance is to prevent loss and in this case being because of defects in title or claims against the property, acts of fraud, anything like that, any kind of mistakes, 
you know, it's covered. We do our best, like I said, but these things can come up and it's worth it to protect the most important investment of your life. And the fact that title insurance is a one-time fee and it lasts as long as you own your home. So one piece of advice for real estate agents is you never want to say to your client, you know, you probably don't need title insurance. I promise you that will be the 1% time that something happens and they are going to come to you and ask you to cover that 70 grand they now owe <laughs> because something was missed. So always protect yourself by suggesting that it's a good idea. And besides the fact loaners or any kind of lenders can make you do it anyways. So the difference um, between this kind of title insurance is owners. And, so a lender's policy basically protects the lender and that coverage will go away once the mortgage is paid off. And some defects in title can't be detected during the company's document search. So the owner could suffer, you know, losses and stuff. So that's why you need that title insurance. And then owner's title insurance is designed to protect that kind of loss. And so basically, if you purchase a $400,000 house and you put $100,000 down on your own and you borrow $300,000, the lender's policy will cover that $300,000 and then the rest will cover you. So you're going to need both types of policies. And it used to be an option um, for lenders, I think, maybe way back when, but now you pretty much have to um, get that kind of coverage. So that's a little, a little bit about title insurance. And then here's some different uh, things that are all covered. Um, and some of these things, people may not really understand exactly what they all are, but we have, we have a list of, I believe, 70 different things that are, are covered. And at Minnesota Title, we have an extended policy. I think it's called an ego policy that actually covers way more um, than other policies cover. So that's a good thing about um, us too. So these are just kind of types of things that can come up. Uh, the right and access to and from a land, little things like that, forged deeds, releases, wills, misinterpretations of wills, all those kind of things. Has anybody ever dealt with something like this where one of their clients actually had something come up after they had purchased their home and then they had title insurance and so it was all okay and resolved? You can chime in if you want, but you don't have to. <laughs> But I think sometimes even if you have a couple examples in your mind of why title insurance is a good thing to have so that you can explain that to your clients, it's helpful, especially for new home buyers that don't really have never been through this before and they're not really sure the types of things that can actually happen um, from buying a home. It's good to have a few examples. And these are some important tips too, is to stay in communication with the loan officer so you know where they are in the process respond really quickly to emails. You know, we try to play on our clients on what kind of communication they want or don't want. Some people just send us something, trust us entirely, and they just want to know when it closes. And that's it. Some people like to be copied into every email. They like to know the steps along the way and where we're at. It just depends on, on what people want. But just staying in that communication, I think, is really key. Um, if we ever have trouble getting a hold of your client or something, we will reach out because Sometimes you need to step in as an agent to help them. And this, just kind of talking about these communication things, this might be a good point um, to talk about the importance of wells. So Sue, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Or Phil, why don't you kind of just about um, how you have to disclose if there's a well on the property and why that's important? Sue, do you want to go ahead or do you want me to talk about the well? Go ahead, Phil. I'll just kind of intervene. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, the, the law requires that on a transaction where there's a well involved, uh, that you yeah, basically have to have a, a well certificate that kind of spells out um, where the well is in relation to the other thing. It's it's kind of a rough drawing typically. Um, we, there's uh, it can be waived in cases where there it was previously disclosed in a prior transaction, and there's a well certificate of record. Um, basically, it's just a, re a requirement. Um, I guess it, it's probably as a result of uh, concern for the environment. Um, if old wells that are uh, are no longer in use or are, are not capped, uh, you know, theoretically, pollution can go down to the water table and cause problems for neighbors and the entire community. Um, so it's just one requirement that uh, typically has in in 
some transactions it applies, you know, most often probably, uh, at least in the metro area, um, there's going to be a well, if, if there is a well, um, there's going to be a well certificate that was filed with the most, with one of the prior transactions. And so uh, we can just simply check a box and not worry about it. But, uh, you know, sometimes a well certificate needs to be recorded. And I think we have something within our documentation that when they're filling out, it either has to be that there is a well, there isn't a well, and if there is a well, is it in use or not in use, and is it properly sealed? Because you can't just say you have a well. I, I mean, there, it has to be either in use or not in use. And there's certain companies that are required that they have to properly seal it. You can't just say, oh, it's not in use. I got something over the top of it or whatever. It just doesn't work that way. And I think that law has been around for at least 20 years, maybe even more, probably, just because there was contamination and people were throwing garbage yeah. in them and things like that. Um, and it has happened where, oh, I feel like there was a recent um, situation where they thought that the, the, the sellers knew there was a well, but then they just pretended that they didn't know there was a well. And I think the real estate agent actually advised them <laughs> to pretend there wasn't a well, so there wouldn't be any. It, but then it's like, then they move in, they discover this is a well. Well, then how do you know if they really didn't know there was a well or if they did know and were lying about it? And then whose responsibility is it now to seal it? Because they don't want to use the well. And I don't know. So it can cause some real problems. So just make sure and advise your clients that, and tell the truth. I mean, it, you can write anything into, into the deal. You Maybe you want to split the cost or lower the fee on something, whatever. Sometimes it's, it's actually less money to, to put the well back in use than to seal it, depending on the location and the kind of well it is. So they can research that too. Um, but it is important and you don't want it to, it to cause any problems at the table because if suddenly you're at the closing table and someone says, oh, you know what, there is a well, but I didn't mention it. Well, there goes your closing is going to blow up right there. <laughs> and we have another class <laughs> coming, yeah. which is um, don't let your closing blow up where we're using real life scenarios of things that have happened. And it's just going to be great because we're going to tell you things that could have saved the deal or things that you should have watched for that were red flags. Um, even when I just was talking to an agent this morning and there was a closing the other day where Alice said at the closing table, well, we're making copies, you know, and when everything's over and done with, um, the client says to the agent, you know, it said I was still married on that paper, but I signed it anyways. And they pushed up my divorce earlier this week and it's actually finalized. And that, that closing took an extra six hours. <laughs> I mean, just these little things. So that'll be another class coming. Okay, I'll keep moving on here because I know I don't have much time. So um, these are some items that need additional attention. So just make sure and keep the communication open with your client. Make sure there's no name changes. If somebody, you know, don't change the status of your marriage during a real estate transaction, it could cause so many problems. You know, if you're married, just stay married through the end of it. If you're not, you know, no reason to push this up. It's only going to cause disruption. Um, if there's any work on the property whatsoever, you know, are the, are the things paid off? Any any kind of mechanics, you know, bills or invoices or anything like that. Make sure to ask a lot of questions and make sure that they uh, answer things truthfully and get as much information as they can. Some people do forget though. You know, they'll be like, oh yeah, that, that is a problem from the past. And anyways, the more information we have up front, the easier it is for us to do our job basically is what I'm saying. These are all the different kinds of transactions that we do. It's not just residential real estate. There's a lot of different kinds of things that a title company deals with. Commercial real estate, of course, got new construction, um, you know, and it, especially with coming up too, there, there may be some uh, for, foreclosures or bank, bank owned homes coming up. Uh, 1031 exchange, we deal with that contracts for deed. I don't know if any of you guys have any have had clients that are in those, but we can handle those really nicely too. Cash transactions, obviously. Those are the best. <laughs> um, any kinds of the refinance is huge right now too. So that's something we've been really busy with. And then this, I just was kind of going to go through the rules of the company, which we kind of already did. You know, this is, this is how we do at Minnesota title. Anyways, we basically have certain coordinators that work with certain closers. So they're kind of like their own team. So we try to set people up with a team where they're only dealing with two people, a coordinator and a closer. And they're the same people that they always deal with unless somebody is sick or on vacation or whatever. So it's really easy to stay in communication and get to know them personally, because when you have a personal connection, it's a lot easier to do business with people. So we have the coordinator processor, and then we have your closer. And that's the one that's usually at the table. 
And then me, the account executive, I, I do a lot of different things. I'll, I'll set people up on teams. Um, I deal with agent education, just trying to help you guys build your business as well and work with different marketing opportunities. Um, and in order to get started, typically you meet with an account executive, get set up with a team, and then we just kind of take it from there and we discuss your likes, dislikes, the way you like to do business and things like that. And so a memorable closing experience, that's what every title company is striving for. We want to be the ex we want to look, make you look like the expert in the eyes of your clients and colleagues. And so what's new in title? <laughs> I'll just go over this really quickly. I mean, if anyone had ever predicted that suddenly tens of millions of jobs would be lost and stocks would drop 25, 30% and bring economic activity to like a standstill, we, we would have been like, no way. And it's crazy that we're actually living in these times right now. So being in a pandemic, um, to fully comprehend the impact of this crisis is, is going to be difficult. Um, I think every part of economic activity has been affected. And questions arise about the trends seen across industries and future implications of those. So there's millions of homeowners that are probably at risk of default on their mortgage um, due to job losses. While at the same time, millions of others are either purchasing new homes or refinancing current mortgages to take advantage of the low interest rates. So we're in really strange times right now. We're handling a lot of different kinds of transactions. Um, you know, the 30 year fixed mortgage rate dropped since March and reached below 3%, I think 2.7 or somewhere around there. And the refinance loans have just increased with the low interest rates. And the refinance originations nearly doubled the first quarter of 2020 compared to 2019 for single family refinances. And I think interest rates were at all time low during this entire summer. And it's probably gonna continue that way. You know, it all depends on, on this whole pandemic thing and where things go. So you kind of have to be prepared either way. Um, historically, the title industry has kind of taken a backseat to, in the consumer's mind um, for real estate agents and mortgage officers because we're kind of like that, that last step to the finish line, but we've had to kind of come to the forefront of it because closings have changed so much since COVID. Um, pretty much, there's kind of, you're never going to have all those people around a, a table again, at least for the near future. And we're dealing with a lot of different kinds of appointment changes um, because we have to do the sellers, which are pre-signs, which is probably going to stay. And then a separate another appointment uh, for the buyers. We're having to drive a lot of different places um, depending on people's comfort level. We've done closings in people's garages, on their picnic tables, um, through windows, uh, whatever we have to do. So there's just a lot of different changes there. And the closing table looks a lot different than it did eight months ago. And I don't know that we'll ever go back to that because it takes time for habits to form. <laughs> and I feel like it's now a habit. And it's funny because some real estate agents are completely fine with it and they absolutely love not having to go to the closings. And then some just miss it dearly. And, you know, at Minnesota Title, we want, we would never want to exclude the real estate agent. Now, granted, there's certain regulations where when you go into a building, uh, obviously you got your mask on and stuff. And we suggest that only people that have to sign attend the signing because we want to limit people, but we have no problem. They want to sit out in the lobby, sit in their car, or be in there with a mask at the end of the table. I mean, it's kind of whatever you're comfortable with because there are some clients that you're dealing with where you know that they are going to want you there and you don't want to be with them on this entire journey and suddenly say, oh, I can't be there closing day. So that's why we're, we're really trying to accommodate everybody. And a lot of things that we've been doing too is First of all, updating our website so it's really easy. You can order a title right from our website. And we have been um, moving forward with the ability to do the remote online notarization run closings. Now, even though we're pretty much set up, the thing is a lot of lenders aren't really set up for that kind of technology yet. And so if they're still wanting a web signature and, and we're able to do it you know, digitally, it's it kind of doesn't make sense because we're going to have to do it both ways. However, we could do um, sell sides probably that way, um, maybe not the buy sides. And I think what right now what real estate agents can be doing is if you love working with a certain lender and you know you want to keep that relationship going, I would ask them if they are set up to do run closings. And if they're not, they should probably look into it because that is going to be coming and you don't want them to not have the ability to do it and that be a determining factor on if your client maybe wants to use them or not. And it's not to say that everybody's gonna to wanna to close digitally, 
But to have it as an option, I think is very important. And not only that, a lot of investors love this idea. A lot of people that go down south for the winter love this idea. I mean, people used to have to fly back here to sign for a closing. I mean, you really shouldn't have to do that. It's 2020. I mean, you can buy a car online. You can buy a house online. And so these types of things, you kind of just got to keep up with the times. Um, I realize I'm talking way over. I'm going to end it now because we got to get Kathy in to talk. Right? Here's our info though. I'll just put this up there. You can reach out to Surai if you have any questions. And if anyone has questions for Phil, you can email or call me and, and I'll get you his contact info too because I realize it's not on here. Thank you, Melanie. I really appreciate it. I think this was a great presentation and you guys, I'll be sending out the recording of this so that you have, uh, you have this information. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Kathy Jambor. Uh, Kathy is with America's Preferred Home Warranty and Kathy just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your business. Thank you so much, Robin. And thank you, Melanie, for your great presentation. Um, my background, um, like Robin said, I'm with America's Preferred Home Warranty. I've been with them since March 2017. But I started in the real estate industry in 1998 as a closer. And I did that for five years until 2003. And then I became a realtor from 2003 to 2013. And then I went back to closing in 2013. And I always tell everybody going back to closing a second time is like giving birth to a second child. You forget how painful it was the first time. <laughs> so I give so much credit to closers, assistants, Melanie, Phil, you guys, you have a real stressful job. Um, I joined America's Preferred Home Warranty in 2017. Um, and I, uh, our company, um, we allow the homeowner to choose their own licensed contractor. It may not be for you, but, um, it really sets us apart in the industry. Um, the homeowner can choose somebody that they know and trust. It can even be a family member or friend. They just have to be licensed and bonded. Um, and we are in strange times, you know, so it really helps for them to be able to have somebody that they can choose themselves. They can peruse the internet and find somebody that's practicing safely um, during these strange times. Um, but the, the one other point that I wanted to make is no matter what, um, I put my contact information in the chat. I, I want you to be able to reach out to me after this because I've only got a couple of minutes but um, you should always be offering a home warranty on every single transaction. And the reason I say that, not because I work for a home warranty company, but it's one of your risk management tools, right? Um, I think you heard Melanie talk about, you know, how you need to protect yourself in this, in this industry. Um, the only reason it's in the purchase agreement is because somebody got sued for not offering one. So offer one. You don't have to sell it. You just have to offer it. Get a signature showing that you offered it, whether they want it or not. Have them sign the waiver. There's um, um, language in the um, waiver that um, is kind of a hold harmless. Um, it's hold harmless language. So I, it, you know, it's really good to um, to offer it on every single transaction. So thank you so much for having me today, Robin. I greatly appreciate it. And um, hopefully someday I can do a home warranty 101 class. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kathy. That was wonderful. And yes, she did put her information in the chat and I'll make sure to include her information as well as Melanie's when I send out the email with the recording. So you guys have all of that. And um, let's see, our next Tuesday mornings at Mar is going to be November 17th and it's going to be um, a Tish talk. So it's going to be a truth, truth, in housing, something, something. Tish, you know what that is, right? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll send you more information on that. But anyway, it's gonna be a great presentation. We've done some uh, webinars on it lately and they've all been filling up. So we decided to do it as a Tuesday morning at Mar also. So that'll be on the 17th. And then um, December 1st, I've got Tanya Troska coming back. I'm sure a bunch of you have been to her presentations um, on marketing, so that'll be good. And then the final one for December will be December 15th. And right now I've got it scheduled as um, Cindy Allen, who I believe is gonna be talking about reverse mortgage and how that works. And, and so that'll be interesting as well. We had um, 
a gentleman many years ago come and do a presentation on that whose name was Steve Garver. And uh, it's a super interesting topic and one that I think a lot of people are confused about. So, um, so anyway, the, the last half of the last three months of this or two months of this year will be awesome. So I hope to see you soon and I hope to see you on the 17th and guys have a great rest of your day and see you later. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, Phil, Sue, Kathy. Bye.